Hello guys and welcome back and before we start today's frankly mahusive review I just wanted to quickly give you guys a heads up about something I'm going to be running for the next month or so. At the end of the year, that is 2021 right now, um, I'm going to be doing a big old giveaway with a bunch of NAS, SSDs and hard drives at the end of the year and the way you can enter this giveaway is nice and simple. In a bunch of videos between now and the end of the year, in the middle of those videos, somewhere along the line, I'm going to mention a Christmas movie. I'm going to sprinkle it in in the middle of the dialogue. And if you do spot that movie, what I want you to do is in the comments, so that is in the comments of this video or in the comments of Facebook or Twitter or something, wherever it is that you've spotted this video, put in the comments the name of that video. That's all you got to do. If you put that in the comments there, you'll be entered in at the end of the year when I do the random draw for all of the little bits and bobs, you are then entered. Nice and simple in this video and in a bunch of videos between now and the end of the year, I'm going to slip in the name of a Christmas movie somewhere in the middle of that video. Go into the comments, bung it down there, and then you're in. For now, let's get on with this mahusive review. <laughs> That is right, we have been waiting a long time for this, but finally it is the review of the brand new powerhouse 12 bay from Synology. This is the Synology DS3622XS. It is their Xeon powered, hugely expandable, hugely bandwidth capable internally and externally solution in disk station form. There's a lot of rack commands that have got not a dissimilar hardware architecture to this, but this is their most powerful desktop solution to date. And in this review, not only obviously are we gonna talk about what we like and a few things that we may not like about this device, but we are ultimately gonna find out if this thing deserves your data. Because let's be completely clear about this, this is the most powerful Synology desktop NAS out there. We can all go home, that's not the point of this review. You guys must know that. But with its price tag knocking around for about 2,300 quid in the UK without the tax and in the US closer to three grand, it has to be said that that is a big old price tag. And a number of you that are moving away from either you know higher tier but low featured um, uh, server solutions or you're moving away from existing cloud uh, providers like Google and Microsoft and such and you know their inclusive um, SAAS or PAAS software as a service and platform as a service um, kind of subscription models and onto something a bit more private and server led or you're an existing Synology user that's upgrading from something a little bit smaller to something way 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 more enterprise this video isn't about saying is this a good NAS? Because it is, it's as simple as that. It's the, one of the best things they've ever put out. But is it worth that price tag? And is it the necessary jump from its predecessor of nearly five years ago, the DS3617XS that came before it? Is it a good enough jump from that? And ultimately, does it deserve your data? Now, a couple of disclaimers off the bat. There are lots of chapters to this video. They should be in the description there, if not in the comments. So you can skip this if you want to. But this is going to be my full hardware review. It's going to be a long, long video, as I'm sure you can see there on the bar at the bottom of the screen. I am going to be producing a much shorter version of this, so should you buy a 5 versus 5 video that should be going live within a week of this one, along with a bunch of software overviews, the look of virtualization, uh, bandwidth and performance, and of course, you guys looking at some high-end Plex Media server stuff with this system. But this is going to be focusing like 80-85% on the hardware in this video because DSM is similar on all of the different systems. It's just a question of the architecture of the NAS and how far it can push and how many services are included with DSM 6.2 and DSM 7 in this unit. I've done a full 40-45 minute review of DSM 7 already. It should be linked in the description as well. So if you want to learn about the software capabilities of that of this device in a greater degree of detail, I strongly recommend watching that video. All this will tell you in terms of software is this system will be able to do every single feature of Synology's DSM platform bar one that we'll touch on later on. So if all you've got to know is in terms of software, this does all of that to the maximum efficiency. There are there is no other desktop NAS from Synology that can you know perform the full breadth of DSM7 in terms of software. But this video is about the hardware. So first thing I'm going to do is get this system out of this box because as much as I would love to unbox this on camera, look at the bloody size of it. I've already had to get it out the first layer of packaging. There's another layer of packaging, foam and more. So let's fast forward, get this out of the box and start talking about what you get for your money. Right, so the first thing that must strike you about this device is the sheer size of this device. I've always been a diehard fan of 
Synology's output in terms of their hardware and design, but look at the size of the DS920 here versus this thing here. That's a four bay, this is a 12 bay. It somehow manages to both be absolutely huge, yet incredibly compact for a system that has 12 SATA bays of storage internally. And in terms of packaging and protection, there's loads of this. There's huge cardboard boxes and protection there. The accessories are in a completely separate container here. There's an enormous amount of thought and protection that has gone into the logistics and packaging container of this device, which again, I fully respect Synology for. That is very much their jam when it comes to their desktop solutions there. So before we talk about the internal hardware and a lot of the architecture of this device, Let's talk about design. They've been utilizing a not dissimilar version of this 12 bay chassis now since its first iteration in the DS3611XS more than a decade ago, I believe. So there's been little tweaks, little improvements along the family's life, but for a, you know, a product family line 12 bay XS series that I think has only ever had four, including this the lines in that product family, that's an incredibly low refresh rate when you compare it against a number of other one, two, and four bay, and even eight bay solutions from the brand. As mentioned, it's a 12 bay solution there on the front. We've got LEDs at the top that donate system activity, system alerts, and of course, we've got one for individual network ports there on the rear. And indeed, this system is one that really takes network connectivity a great deal more seriously than anything else we've seen in the desktop bracket thus far. If we look at the bottom there, there isn't a front mounted USB port there, which is something that, again, is a very petty gripe, I'll be the first to admit. But when you're dealing with this much storage, the idea of an added layer of a localized USB backup as well with all the other multifaceted backups wouldn't be the end of the world. And maybe you're someone that's going to introduce a drive regularly. I actually quite like front mounted drives. It's an incredibly minor point given that this is a big old system here that, again, is not designed to be locally within desk view. This is a system that needs to be tucked away. You should not be in close proximity to this because firstly, it is an entirely metal chassis around the front, back and base with only this front panel being the plastic part. The trays are plastic, but again, the drives you're gonna utilize inside, which is gonna be a point of contention for some that we'll touch on in a moment, means that this is gonna be a noisy box when in operation, so again, as much as I like this system, do bear in mind, if you're going to utilize it, you're going to have to be quite far away from it. They reported it on their own spec sheets at 25 dBA, but I will highlight at those spec sheets there that the audio levels that were recorded by it were recorded using Seagate 2TB Iron Wolf drives there, the full population. Of course, you're not going to run a setup like that on this for several reasons, again, that we will touch on later on. Predominantly, this is a system that's going to be making a fair old noise of the vibration uh, against that metal. Then it's going to be a light hum, really. And on the back, there's going to be those two rear fans that we could talk about in a moment. And of course, the hard drive media inside. Now, if we have a look at one of these trays here, we can see that these are click and load trays. They take advantage of the spring loading there, but on top of that, they do allow you to install a hard drive very, very easily inside the top there. Now, I will highlight the first kind of area of contention a lot of people, of course, have raised. The fact that this system is only supported um, with Synology's own hard drives inside. And that was an area that, when it first sort of came about, in mid to late 2020, a lot of people were kind of, oh, I am not a fan of this. And of course, there are arguments for and against it. I've made several videos on this very subject. An enterprise system like this, you're going to want to use enterprise level drives with it. And yes, the Synology hard drive, the HAT5300 of SATA hard drives. Here we have one right here. These hard drives are pretty darn good let's be realistic they are priced at a pro series cost so you know comparable to the likes of wd's um red pro series or um seagate's iron wolf pro series but they're even though they're priced at that level their build quality such as their workload uh, rate of 550 tb their annual workload uh, their internal performance and to general the level of um you know uh, performance from them is far far more uh, desirable and comparable to that of enterprise level drives like the Seagate Exos series or the Ultrastar or the WD Gold. Indeed, there are advantages to using Synology's own hard drives inside, such as being able to update the firmware from within your Synology NAS system, stuff like that, which is very, very good. But at the same time, 
The Synology hard drive series is only available currently in three capacities, 8, 12, and 16 TB. Um, the hard drives themselves are, you know, because they're enterprise quality, they make a lot of clicks, hums, and words because they're designed to spin up very, very quickly and deal with incredibly um, intensive workloads. And moreover than anything, a lot of people do not like the idea that they are restricted, or they, at least they feel restricted, to only utilizing Synology's own hard drives in their own system. Now, Synology say that in order to get the very most out of this system, they do recommend that you use their drives because they've been designed and tested in conjunction with them. And therefore, they're choosing that they're not going to support users by using those you know, non-Synology hard drives. Now, moving forward one extra step from that, if you do try to use um, Seagate or WD or any drives like that in their system, um, and you know you get in DSM seven, you get to the storage manager. The storage manager will not allow you to use non-compatible or unsupported drives in your RAID array in that storage pool, which again is flat out putting a hand out and stopping you. Now this is not cut and dry. If you are migrating from an existing system, you can port those over without it affecting any kind of warranty or support of this system from Synology. Indeed, the same applies to SHR. Another thing I think a lot of people have had difficulty kind of getting behind on the XS series. For those that aren't aware, Synology on a number of their systems supports something called Synology Hybrid RAID, SHR. It allows you to uh, mix and match drives in your system. Now, of course, you're not going to do that on day one. No one's going to do that on day one. You're going to buy one or more drives that are all the same capacity, all the same brand, stick them inside and enjoy yourself. But as your storage starts to run out, you might look at adding more drives. Maybe you're going to part populate something you can do on this and pretty much any Synology NAS. And when you want to add drives later on, maybe you, you know, times have changed, bigger hard drives have become available, the price of bigger hard drives has come down over time, and you want to add bigger hard drives. Now, traditional rate configurations don't allow you to do that. You have to have all the drives exactly the same, otherwise it will treat any drive as the smallest available capacity. So you could have nine 10 TB drives and one 1 TB drive, it will see every single drive as 1 TB. SHR allowed you to mix and match those drives. The performance was less than a traditional RAID 1, 5, 6, etc., but it allowed you to mix and match those drives and take advantage of larger capacities as you added more drives. SHR has never been available on an XS system, and this has not broken that trend. So a number of you that are looking at this 12 base system, bear in mind that one of the most appealing uh, things for a lot of you that have moved over to Synology, the SHR system, is not supported on this. Now, when we reached out to Synology on this last year, they did highlight that SHR, they think, is, is great for flexibility and home and prosumer and uh, low to mid-level users, but high-end users want performance, want throughput. And for them to actually say that these boxes can perform the way they perform, they made a decision to only allow traditional RAID configurations on the system. So again, some of you, when you look at the XS series, you're not keen on this idea of um, kind of reduced compatibility and support on drives by the brand, and also the idea that you don't have access to that great Synology feature that very, very few brands offer there. So the other thing on the storage I will touch on is it doesn't support SAS either, which really surprised me. I thought this would be the unit that not only would support um, traditional hard drives, um, but would also support um, SAS drives as well. And even Synology have released their own version of SAS hard drives as well. So it's really strange that this system with its incredible architecture inside now doesn't support that. It supports their SSDs, of course. Again, we can have a look and, you know, take a little look at some of the architecture of the drives and stuff that are inside that we're going to talk about later in the video and the upgrades that are open to us. And they do have the SAT5200 SATA SSD series, which are completely compatible with this for storage balls. But still, nonetheless, I do think a number of you are going to find that kind of slightly reduced um, attitude to storage media on this device a little bit limiting. And it's something you should be aware of when going in. Because that doesn't, you know, undersell the drive media in question. The hard drives and the SSDs are all incredibly durable, great workloads, great performance, and I would argue very well priced. 
So you're not being cheapened out on. It's the idea that you, you're not given the flexibility of choice that some people might enjoy. Before I get a little bit too ahead of myself, it's worth highlighting that a lot of the things like the drives and the accessories I've mentioned are optional extras with this device. The base level system does arrive with a few accessories. However, it's worth highlighting that what you are getting is very much the base level package with this device. So in our box of accessories, we receive, let's open that up, we have our UK mains lead, external there. Bear in mind, this is an internal PSU system, so a 550 watt PSU inside. So we get rid of that over there. We've also got two uh, cat cables there, but I will highlight, just looking at them there, I believe I'm right, that these are Cat5e cables, which again, mm, not a fan of, because I know a number of you may already be aware, this is a massively 10GBE equipped system. It has two 10G base T, so copper based 10GBE ports on the rear. It has a couple of 1G ports, sure, but Come on guys, I'm, I'm kind of surprised that you didn't include a CAT6 cable, or at least a couple of CAT6 cables with this device, because most users that are looking at this are gonna go straight into 10 GBE, and I don't think it would have cost that much more to spring for CAT6. So long as you've never really included CAT6 with a lot of their devices, and again, the benefits of CAT6 are only really felt on longer distance 10G in terms of latency, of course, but still, a little surprised by the CAT5s there. Uh, lastly inside here, we have screws, for that two and a half inch media there at the base. And we have keys and the instruction manual for the first time set up. Now those keys are quite important because this system does allow you of course to lock each of these bays. So we've installed that drive inside, slot it inside there. And again, this is where that spring loading comes in. If that drive isn't completely in line or completely installed correctly uh, with the SATA connector there at the back, that will not allow you to do that. Locking that tray, nice and simple, lock it, that tray's not coming out anytime soon. Now, no one should be really pulling drives out of this thing willy-nilly anyway, but accidents can happen. Moreover, DSM-7, for all of its benefits, and genuinely some of the things like uh, the RAID performance increases there, a lot of the background caching has been vastly improved as well, and the CPU inside this does have a lot of back-end caching improvements over its predecessor, the DS3617XS, but I will say that the Synology system, as I see it, still doesn't support resilvering. Resilvering, for those that aren't aware, is when uh, a drive can be accidentally removed. It still has all the data inside. If you reintroduce the drive into the RAID that still has the data inside, rather than rebuilding the entire RAID from scratch or having to reintegrate this drive into the degraded RAID volume, it can see that that drive still has the original data. It's something that a lot of people who keep clones of drives um, will allow, allow it, the system to uh, recover from a degraded ray build in minutes rather than hours. Now again, that is a tough feature to implement, so again, it's nice that the locks there are on the front to know about there. Next up, let's take a moment to talk about the ports and connections on this bad boy, because again, one of the things that I really, really like about this system is that unlike a lot of uh, desktop solutions in the Synology Disk Station portfolio, which have a tendency because of limitations of things like CPU and PCI lanes and chipset, result and to keep within a certain price point, end up having certain elements of compromise introduced. This system is one that has incredible internal bandwidth potential and incredible external bandwidth potential. So if we have a look here, let's get straight to the crunch here. We have a couple of 10 GBE base T ports there, those 10 GBE ports there, which of course support link aggregation, allow you to have enormous bandwidth to be shared between a connected series of users. So if you're introducing this into a multi-port, 10 port switch, then all of the users, whether they're connecting with one, 2.5, 5, or 10 GBE connections are going to get some serious bandwidth potential. Of course, it's heavily reliant on the media you put inside, and I'm pleased to say that Synology have already put together a lot of performance overviews for that, and you're really gonna have to max this system out to give this any kind of hard time. Indeed, not only do you have those 10 GBU ports there on the rear, or 10G, because I know a number of you hate that I add the E on the end. On top of that, you have a PCIe upgrade slot here. Now, the PCIe upgrade slot there at the top, much like the hard drive uh, compatibility and support, is a lot smaller than one might expect. They're not as strict about maybe network upgrade cards and cache upgrade cards as they are with the hard drives and uh, memory upgrades on this system, but still, there's a pre you know predominantly only um, on the look on the form, the majority of the uh, PCIe upgrade cards that are available to you are Synology owned. And of course, this system predominantly looks at cards that fall into two real categories. You have your M2 
upgrade cards. These allow you to add NVMe SSD slots inside this system for caching, where the benefits of NVMe's that are introduced into your NAS system are, and their improved uh, performance and low latency are used to improve the um, read and write performance of data inside the system, so whether that's databases, whether that is virtual machines, commonly accessed files. This can fall down into several categories where you would install Synology's own SSDs inside. Once again, you can only use their SSDs within their cards within this system. Those SSDs can be utilized uh, predominantly, let's break it down to the two most popular. You've got write caching where files that are uploaded to the system are committed to the SSDs first and then moved to the larger, slower, but more affordable hard drive array internally in that rate configuration. Uh, or you can have read caching where more commonly accessed files and more um, high frequency files, be it from one or multiple users, clones of them are moved over to the areas of SSD that are on that card. And then when a command is given to the system to access those files, the NAS will pull the files from the SSD uh, rate configuration that is the cache rather than the hard drive array. Predominantly, this the benefits of the latter there are felt normally in latency and responsiveness because it's more geared towards I.O. files, much smaller ones there. So again, larger databases and again, VMs there. Big multimedia files hardly ever will feel the benefit there. And of course, the new combination um, read-write caching as well, which again is why most of these systems have two ports inside. Now, the other kind of upgrade card is network improvement cards there. One and two port cards predominantly will cover copper or fiber. So, and of course, there isn't just 10 GBE either. There's single and two port cards all the way up to using FC fiber channel cards at 25 GBE per port. And again, with link aggregation possible and combining with the available performance here, you can get a relatively affordable um, two port Synology 10 GBE card install it inside this and then you have four 10 GBE ports which again once you max this thing out either with Synology's own SAT 5200 SSDs or you fill it with Synology hard drives and use some of the expansion systems that we're going to talk about in a bit you can get incredible performance indeed with four 10 GBE ports Synology um, have reported that fully populated with their own 960 uh, gigabyte SSDs the SATA ones there in a RAID 5 configuration, it hit 4,720 megabytes per second sequential read and 2,621 megabytes per second sequential write. And again, in RAID 6, near enough identical, of 4,700 and 2,400 respectively. Even in IOPS, you will see an enormous performance where they reported that this system crossed over um, a quarter of a million read 4K random IOPS there. I think two, uh, 260,000 uh, read 4K IOPS there in a 10 gig test. Now, on top of those upgrade cards, you've also got the option of combination cards. Now, Synology were not the first people to produce combo cards that have two NVMe slots inside and 10 GBE on board but they have by far so far produced the best version of it with this PCIe Gen 3x8 card so a potential 8,000 megabytes per second throughput which again shared amongst those SSDs and the 10 GBE result in little to no bottleneck of the performance between this and the system internally but again these are optional upgrades another thing about this box as much as I genuinely like it I don't like that it doesn't have M2 SSD cache slots inside Pretty much all of their modern generation high business or XS desktop systems now have M2 NVMe slots inside. Synology have talked a big, big game and pushed this subject incredibly hard, as well as tweaking and improving DSM to really take advantage of SSD caching quite substantially. And the fact that this system doesn't have that by default and I've got to go and get an optional extra card, it's a little bit of a bummer for me. It's not the end of the world, and yes, their SSDs as well are an optional extra anyway, so I would have had to spend something to use them, but it's a shame that it's not included. Maybe it's a limitation, again, of the CPU, PCI, uh, PCI lanes, and that chipset internally, but still, I'm sure they could have factored it in there. Now, if we have a look at the remainder of the ports, the rest of the ports are a combination of yay and oh no. Um, so, first and foremost, yes, there are some one gigabit Ethernet ports on there. Now, a number of you might be thinking, what a waste of time. I'm not touching them. I've got my 10 GBE. Fine, you're right. The 10 GBEs are better. But what about if you're connecting to your internet connection uh, via your router or your modem or whatever, and it's not higher than gigabit Ethernet, uh, gigabit uh, internet? In that case, you're going to need 
a 10 GBE port for that. So why waste it? It's going to be much, much better to have some 1 GBE ports knocking around that allow you to utilize them for low priority services, a low level network. Maybe you've got two or three IP cameras knocking around that you don't want the same network subset as all your connected users. That makes a lot of sense to still have those 1 GBE. So I do think there's a place for it there. Um, rather uniquely, there is another 1 GBE port on this. It's called Out of Bounds Management Port there, and it allows a direct interface with the system when your connected network either goes down or there's complications or um, shut down problems in a local area network. Now, I'm not going to be testing the OOB port on this. I might privately off camera have a little check about what happens when you connect into it from what i understand it allows another entry point into the nas that still has all the usual security and encryption protocol but allows a way to get around the existing network and commit maintenance and troubleshoot repairs so again a nice extra little feature and definitely better than the strangely always present comms port which i have spoken to a lot of people over the years and i don't know anyone that uses that comms port it's not a vga it's a comms port that allows you to integrate it with an existing uh, management and network system there now moving away from that before i talk about something i like let's go to something i'm less keen on let's talk about those usb ports there let's address it those usb ports there don't get me wrong be great for adding external storage i mentioned it earlier in the video didn't i it's going to be nice to have the ability to add some usb storage for a localized backup or to back up regular drives or a big old raid subject you know chuck on a lacy or something attach it nice big raid backup to have a logical backup there that uses das but why are they usb 3.2 gen 1 why are they five gigabits per second why is synology started going EOL, um, end of life, on so many of their USB services in DSM-7. They've got rid of USB printers, they've got rid of all kinds of dongles, and got rid of little adapters and stuff. USB peripherals on DSM-7 are fewer than ever. Yes, there's external storage, but if you're only really going to be able to utilize these for external storage, and maybe the odd UPS, some very unique um, enterprise-level architecture there, that's your USB heartbeat kind of stuff, at least don't give us two USB 3.0 two gen one ports you know fiddle around with things cut a few things back and give us usb 3.2 gen 2 at 10 gigabits per second because given the scale of this device at 12 bays that's a lot of storage and yes not all backups are going to be going nas to the usb maybe there'll be regular recurrent daily backups to the nas uh, on a usb drive but we're at a point now where usb 3.2 gen 2 at 10 gigabit is you know, ubiquitous, it's so, so common now. And the price point of it to me suggests that there must be a reason, hopefully, technically, why it's not on there. Because I do think people are going to want faster backups. Even external USB SSDs now are incredibly affordable. It's not four or five times the cost of hard drives. We're talking two, maybe two and a half times the size for a much, much faster drive. So, yeah, I'm not overly keen on the way Synology have gone on USB ports right now. They're still supporting storage to a big, big, big degree and i like it but again they just make me sad those ports but what doesn't make me sad are these two little ports these hd mini sas ports here for attaching 12 by expansions to each as the name suggests this system supports up to 36 individual storage bays now that is including the two expansions and those expansions don't come cheap by the way but they're both 12 by expansions that connect via that lovely external connector there they don't use eSATA here which has uh, you know a slight bottleneck there it's going to be 600 megs that, that isn't present here with those much much larger um, uh, connectivity there and with those expansion systems that allows you to really expand this storage over time now of course, you can spread your RAID over if you like. So say you've got this 12 base fully populated, you've chucked in the 8TB Synology drives there, and over the last few years, you've maxed out. You've got all your storage, but you've got all your shares, you've got all your target, you know, your LUNs, your target LUNs, you've got all of your, you know, your um, mapped um, areas of storage there with a clone between places. You've created a bunch of hypervisors as well, and VMs that people are utilizing. You're connected with some other online stuff like Google Workspace and Office 365 using an active uh, backup suite. You've got all of that stuff in place. The last thing you want to do is buy another NAS and start changing a lot of these directories. So you can, of course, attach an expansion and then grow the RAID into that next box. Yes, you can chop a change and get big drives, which unfortunately with SHR on here will be difficult. But you can add on a new series and then with that 12 bank expansion system, start spreading that RAID out and growing that storage pool. Now, I personally wouldn't recommend that because 
the idea that your RAID is now in two boxes that, with a cable connecting them, that to my eyes here is not screw locked, is a bit risky, but it is an option. Most people I would still recommend who are going to use an expansion, use it for cloning, use it for backups, use it uh, for adding storage, but not to spread the pool over both of these systems. So again, I've always loved the expandability of this 12, 12 base system. It's something that I think is very remiss uh, and nowhere near as uh, widely supported as it should be on some of the lesser systems there. So again, in terms of expandability, still mwah, chef's kiss. Finally, another often overlooked feature of this system, which again is very small and not everyone seems to take advantage of it, is this system allows you to not only, because it has to be really, really cool with these big fans, control those fans, but you can also perform maintenance very, very easily. Something that is actually kind of absent in a lot of different Synology NASes is the ease with which you can just remove Let's remove that. The squeakiness is my table, don't worry. You can just remove the fan array for maintenance and cleaning. Something that, you know, is fairly common in rack mount use, but is incredibly rare in desktop utilization without dismantling the whole damn thing or just getting a hoover and going around each of the fan values. But this allows you to commit that area of cleaning and maintenance there. It's a little tiny feature that so many people overlooked that is only really present in these larger scale devices. Next up, I wanna talk about internal hardware. Namely, I wanna talk about the CPU and memory. Now, before we start talking about that CPU, because there is some good and bad there, let's talk about the memory, because a number of you, like myself, when you saw this device at first, when it got kind of shown online on the East before anywhere else in the world, a lot of us, much like its predecessor, were going, ah, oh, 16 gig of DDR4 ECC memory, lovely stuff. Wait, maximum 48 gig? What, how, how do you, what, what? Now, a lot of you were confused about that. First and foremost, it is because this system has 16 gig by default and it's got two eight gig modules inside. But if you remove this side panel, which again, I've already done by removing all the screws here on the back so you didn't have to watch me use a screwdriver, we have two upgrade slots here inside. Now, these are empty slots, as you can see. These allow you to utilize Synology's own memory here. This is their own ECC memory, which arrives in um, four and eight and 16, just large uh, modules all the way through. And again, all of this is ECC memory. So error code correction or error correcting code memory. It means that as data is passed through it, a checksum is created at the beginning and end for comparison. And if there are any issues with the data as it passes through, there is an element of file self-healing and data self-healing to avoid things like bit rot. Now, this is something that Synology have taken very, very seriously with all of their enterprise and SMB level systems, such as the 1821 and the 1621 and stuff like that. These systems all arrive with ECC memory as well as support internally of the BTRFS file system, another um, great addition that has a lot of file self-healing and internal checks, which again is great stuff. I know a number of you would have liked to have seen if Synology are ever going to tackle the subject of ZFS. If that ever happens, it's not going to happen for years. They are very much on board with BTRFS with a number of their key applications practically demanding that you do utilize BTRFS in order for their uh, some of their software platforms to work internally. And again, nothing wrong with BTRFS. I personally use it on every Synology that I use here on the channel. But I will say that a number of you that have you know, been in data storage for decade upon decade, generally will all your heart live with ZFS or EXT4. So in terms of these memory slots here, as I say, these are empty by default, but again, you can pop memory inside there and it goes up to 48 gig because you've got a 16 gig by default and you can insert two more 16 gig modules inside there. That is the maximum. But the really weird, weird thing is that internal CPU inside there, that Xeon, actually supports higher than that. This has been a physical choice by Synology here. Now, some of their systems have been known to support 64 gig, and of course, I will be testing sometime very, very soon um, memory surpassing that 48 gig to see how it runs. And I know that is not something that Synology endorses. It's not something they enjoy, and certainly something that I cannot recommend to anyone at home, but I know a number of you are gonna be curious if it will actually see that higher level of memory. So of course, we'll be testing that out. But let's turn this device around and take a little look at the other panels. I feel like I'm doing reverse Lego right now as I remove the rest of these panels. Another thing I will touch on very, very quickly, by the way, is I'm always a fan of these side panels here. Much like the rear of this system with the large amount of ventilation that has to run through this system and the ability to clean and you know perform maintenance, much like you find on a rack mount, I've always liked that Synology have got these ventilated mesh panels inside because they do capture 
a lot of the dust that's floating around in the air there. If you've ever looked at the back of your PC under that desk, and if you do, make sure you haven't just eaten, um, then you'll know that there's a lot of dust in the air from our dead skin to anything from our pets. So the idea that I can just remove this panel and clean that mesh out whenever I need to, still a big fan of that. Now taking a good long look inside this system, we can see first and foremost, there is a ton of ventilation. This system, as I mentioned in the intro, when we compared it against the 920 there in terms of scale, this system somehow at the same time, by the way, this isn't the lightest box, uh, this system, when you know it has 12 bays of storage, somehow still manages to be massive, but yet very compact at the same time. So we've got that ventilation there. You can see the giant heat sink there at the back that's utilized for that CPU that we're gonna to touch on in just a moment. If we look through the top, we can see there that the cabling there for the PSU as it funnels in to a back plane with all 12 of those SATA connectors is very tidy as they all get funneled into that big old 550 watt PSU there at the top and a big clear run there to the back where the CPU is. Again, it's very hard to show you this here on this camera angle, but I will say if you do visit the NAS Compares Review uh, linked in the description, you'll see that the other two eight gigabyte uh, memory modules inside the two times um, DD, uh, eight gig DDR4 ECC memory are located just to the right hand side of that CPU. So they're not soldered onto the board, but they're near enough impossible to reach without completely dismantling this whole system. Now, if I angle this just right, as we talk about this CPU, it might make things a little bit relevant there for you. So this CPU here, as you can see, it's not taking advantage of an active fan inside. It's using a huge heat sink there, which is taking up, I'd say about a third of the depth of this system. Maybe we can angle that around for a better look there. And that CPU inside is a six core Xeon. Um, it's part of the Xeon D family there. And um, it's very, very similar, I've got to say, to its predecessor in the near four to five years old unit that came before this. So it's the D1531. It's a six core 2.2 gigahertz CPU there. And it goes up to 2.7 gigahertz again. That is um, like, um, it's got 12 threads, which is great to see there. The previous unit had a four core Xeon inside there, the D1527, um, uh, which was an eight thread CPU there. And this CPU, it's mostly good, I've got to say, but in terms of the time difference between its release and the previous previous generation CPU there, not a lot of time has gone by. It is good, and it's still the most powerful desktop uh, that Synology have in the market right now, both internal performance and external performance. But the CPU that came before it, that 1527, and this one, the 1531, they're both 2015 series CPUs from that product family. They've both got the same clock speed. This one's got more cores. It's got a little bit more L2, L3 cache. You know, um, it's gonna, you know, provide and do a lot more with its overall abilities there. Um, but it's not an enormous jump over its predecessor. It's just the same family CPU there. Still supports the same memory. And there's only a few little differences and tweaks in between those two CPUs availability there. Yes, it's a more expensive CPU, but it's not a giant jump. And particularly when you look at the SA series and a lot of the, uh, like when we talked about the RS3621XS earlier this year in like February, March, that CPU was an eight core Xeon that was still relatively the same family, but it was a decent enough jump. Whereas this CPU seems like not an enormous jump over the one that came before it. And again, um, Synology have always been a fan in their enterprise level series of not going for graphically enabled CPUs like your Intel cores. They go straight into the Xeon market there, so you have no embedded graphics here on board. This is raw power, which means if you're going to be doing, you know, um, GU, GUI or uh, graph, high graphical LED stuff, and again, I'm talking about 4K uh, multimedia and indeed 8K as well, which we're going to have to look at sometime soon. This is not going to be a CPU that's going to be efficient with it. It's going to put a lot more horsepower into those things. It's still an incredibly powerful file and throughput CPU, which again, when you're dealing with 12 bays of storage, when you're dealing with a couple of 10 GBUs, when you're dealing with a lot of memory, when you're dealing with a PCIe upgrade card that could give you another 20, 40, or 80 gigabits per second there, that CPU is going to be great for throughput on IOPS and databases and the like, but Again, not being graphically enabled, and particularly when you go back in time, like eight, nine years to the DS3612XS, that had an Intel i3 inside. It actually had an embedded graphics CPU. So there was a time where Synology were entertaining of that. Yes, it was a while ago, but still, it's a great CPU, but it's not 
as new as some people might like for a system that is, you know, you know, the people of, you know, the previous generation came out four or five years ago. It's not an enormous jump there. It's great in terms of cores, and there's a little bit more to play with there, but I kind of hoped it'll be a little bit beefier than that. And all of this adds up, of course, to what do we think of this NAS? Of course, it is still the most powerful desktop NAS that Synology have out there. And if you are in love with Synology's DSM platform, whether you're a business user that wants to, you know, move away from those software as a service and platform of services from Microsoft and Google and, and stuff like that, and you want your own in-house system with its own um, management tools, its own email tools, its own multimedia tools, its own v VM hypervisor database tools, um, widespread backup tools internally. The fact that you can synchronize and carry over data from those platforms, as mentioned, all of the email account data, all of the on online editing data, the fact that this system has its own office tools built in, its own communication tools built in, AI recognition and more, all of it built in to this incredibly powerful system you know, this is the best you're going to get in desktop. If you don't want to have a big old rack mount sounding like a jet engine in your home or, you know, obviously a business environment, this is going to be great for you. So for those of you that are wondering, is this the best desktop um, Synology NAS out there? It is. It's as simple as that. It is. It's powerful and it gives, there's no compromise on this system in terms of performance. Now, let's talk about what I liked and what I didn't like. Let's, let's start positive. We should always start positive. Things that I like, even though that CPU feels like it could have been a bigger jump than it was over its predecessor, I still love it. It's a Xeon 6 core in a desktop system. There isn't enough of that. When you say Xeon, most NAS providers jump straight onto the rack mount bandwagon, and a number of us that don't have rack mount or a rack mount kits in our home are all like, oh, that's not fair. I'll just play with my Pentium then. So it's nice to have a 6 core Xeon in a desktop form. On top of that, let's be straight. 12 bays and two 10 GBE ports, the limits are... You know, the, the chains are undone. It's a huge amount of internal and external bandwidth potential there. And once you pair it with that 16 gig of memory and that 6 core Xeon, bandwidth wise, it's going to be breathtaking inside there. Also, the upgradability, although it doesn't have those M2 slots, which I'll touch on in a bit, having the upgradability in a PCIe Gen 3x8 slot when a lot of NAS brands have a tendency to compromise that slot and, you know, to you know, free up some of that to other features around the system, give you a slot that is hugely wide in its PCIe three times eight architecture. So a potential eight thousand megs throughput between the card and the system. It means you can use very high performing cache cards. You can use those combo cards or increased um, um, network interface upgrade cards like the fiber channel, like the dual port ten GBE. Um, on top of that, DSM on this system. It's going to be incredible. Let's be realistic about this. DSM 7 or DSM 6.2, this is the best des desktop experience you're ever going to have. So if you already love DSM, but you were just feeling your current system had a bit of a glass ceiling or you just couldn't, you know, you wanted to move up from hundreds of users to thousands of users, bang, this is where your money should live. It's scalability as well, not only in terms of the overall storage, we can populate this with as little as one hard drive if you choose, or fully populate it on day one and then add two 12 bay expansions down the line. You can't rival that kind of scalability in terms of storage there. And once you include that with the ability of multiple LAN ports and that PC upgrade slot, the scalability in its lifetime is fantastic. And of course, Synology give this a five year warranty. You try to find a lot of tech online that has a five-year warranty. It's not as common as you think. Even two to three years is a stretch on a lot of technology these days, and they lump a five-year warranty on this. And once you think about all of the cards, all of the SSDs that they include, all of the hard drives inside, every single one of these things has a five-year warranty on board. So everything is kind of synchronized together with that warranty on these systems. Now, it's not all good. Let's summarize. Things I didn't like. I don't like that... The NVMe upgrade slot uh, for caching, as much as I love caching on the Synology, and again, I've got two Synologies, both have got caching going. I don't like that, it, you know, that's not a, an available by default option. It seems silly, given their portfolio and all of the other systems in their desktop seemingly have this, all the way down to the DS722 bay. This not having it is slightly embarrassing. Also, the Synology media only, Again, I'm always going to have mixed feelings about this because on the one hand, a lot of us think we don't like being locked in. We don't like the idea that I can't choose the drives I want to go for. Maybe I want to populate this with smaller drives. Maybe I want to use different kinds of drives. 
Maybe I want to use surveillance only drives. But at the same time, I have to accept that the Synology HAT 5300s are still among some of the best drives in terms of value and output. And indeed, if you are looking at a drive and you want the best performance for your money, they're kind of the cream of the crop right now. And if you compare them against Exos's and Pros and Golds, the performance ultimately wins on these drives in terms of what you're paying as well with them being, as mentioned, enterprise class drives at a pro series price so again as much as i want to rag on that we have to be slightly balanced about that that yeah i don't like the way they've handled compatibility by going you can't use any of them but still there probably was a better way of doing that but still um, on top of that that memory of 48 gig i find really peculiar now i understand Physically, by the looks of things, limiting it at 48 um, gigabytes is probably a choice because of the way the architecture is. It's incredibly difficult to get to the two internal slots inside there, and it would have forced a massive redesign, and therefore you can only access physically two slots, and therefore two more 16 slots on there, you're going to be at 48. Given that CPU can go higher than that, and given the architecture of this system... If I was a VM user and I wanted to have some powerhouse VMs running on this, I think 48 gig, I'd like to know that I could raise the bar a little bit there. So it's a little bit of a shame. And finally, and again, I'm going to start, I'm going to end this video largely in the West same place I started. I don't like that there's no SHR on this. I love SHR. It's a little extra feature of being able to have a flexible RAID system that I hope one day Synology reverses the decision on and allows on a lot of the enterprise level kit. It's a small thing and not everyone's ever going to take advantage of it. Normally when people upgrade their storage media they replace the whole array so it makes a lot of sense why they wouldn't do that and include that feature but still nonetheless this has been the hardware review of the DS3622XS Plus. I hope you've enjoyed it guys. Again, I'm going to be doing a lot more on this. I know this has been an exceedingly long review, and there will be a much shorter Should You Buy coming very, very soon. But I wanted to cover the bases as much as I could in this single video here at launch. And of course, we will be looking at performance of this of virtual machines in terms of throughput. And of course, you people that are looking at this as a powerhouse Plex Media server, much like its predecessor. Thank you so much for watching. There is a full review with even more detail that's being updated regularly. Um, it, uh, over on NAS Compares, linked in the description down there, the review of the DS3622XS Plus. If you've enjoyed this video, chuck me a like. It genuinely helps me on this channel. It helps me understand what I'm doing right and makes each video better than the last. And if you want to learn more about this, if we cover more subjects, then do click subscribe. Finally, if you want some free advice or you're wondering about the right data storage solution for your needs, take advantage of the free advice section linked in the description to NAS Compares genuinely free we don't do anything with your email there's some donate buttons use them ignore them it's manned by two humans me and Eddie the web guy might take us a day or two to answer your email sometimes because we are humans with lives but we answer everyone with free and partial advice i will see you on the next video